Oh, hello there. The U.S. Piper with you. Hmm. Smoking some uh, Seattle Pipe Club plum pudding and bourbon barrel. <sighs> I didn't like it right off, just to be honest with you. Uh, I rushed it, you know, I opened it up, I was real excited about it, had high expectations, hadn't had any of their other blends, hadn't had the regular version of that blend, which I really wish I had done first. But why do th something sensibly when you can jump right in with both feet, as is my apt aptness to do? Is aptness a word? I don't think it is. But uh, I just liked the idea of it. and uh, Of course, you watch an old Hollywood Briar video of anything, and it looks so good you want to eat it because he just does beautiful, beautiful film work uh, and editing and production. It's just, oh, the guy's just gifted. And uh, every time he shows any tobacco, it makes you want to eat the stuff. It looks so good. So uh, that didn't help. I had to have some. But after giving it some air time, left the top off the container for an hour and a half, two hours, let it get some air, broke a few flakes up, let it get just crispy in my tray, tossed it back in there, let that pull a little bit more out, uh, rehydrating that, and all of a sudden, 180 degree turnaround. I love this stuff. Um, not my favorite, but really, really good. It's got a very unique quality to it. It adds a little spiciness to it that's nice. And it went from over the top knock you over to, damn, this is a good smoke. You know, I like this. I'll probably reorder this at some point. I'm kind of excited to try the Mississippi River uh, uh, rum barrel aged because I think the rum with that style of blend will really work. Uh, it might be a little more for me. It doesn't have the uh, Cavendish in it. Uh, so I don't know. I'm going to definitely need to try that one too. It's a it's a good smoke. It's definitely a good smoke. Um, a lot going for it. And when it settles down after some air time, give it a little tray time. Let the moisture get about right for you. It's a really satisfying uh, smoke. If you like, you know, Latakia. It's not very balkany, but the Orientals are definitely present. I mean, they're, you're not going to miss them. You don't have to search them out. They're, they're there, and they're nice. They're very nice. And it works. It's just uh, I didn't treat it right at the beginning, and so there's a learning curve for me on that. And, uh, you know, some things you can get away with smoking new and, and uh, you know, pop the top, rub it out, smoke it too wet, you know. Some of the esoterica, esoterica stuff or the uh, gallus stuff, you know, you can kind of get away with smoking it on the wet side when you're in a hurry to just try it. And it's not bad. And the weird thing is some of those blends like to be smoked a little a little more moisture present than you would normally smoke a lot of blends like them. Um, and it just seems to kind of help a little bit. Um, they're kind of their own thing. Like the Esoterica stuff, like the Margate and the Pembroke, to me kind of have a little bit of this almost fermented quality to it. And uh, I think for that to come across right, it needs to be a little more damp than you would normally smoke a similar blend from somebody else. In all fairness, I haven't really tried smoking either of those really dry, so I, I guess I need to do that before I give an, an official opinion, but that's that's what I feel. Thus far, Ooh. 
But uh, yeah, that's a that's a nice nice smoke. It adds a little spiciness to it. I don't have nearly hardly anywhere near as much of the bourbon essence, but there's still it's more of a back note and a background, and it's it bobs and weaves with some of the other flavors in it now, and it's really nice once you once you let it settle down a little bit in the tin, and uh, after it's had a little air, you give it a little bit of tray time, and man, it's it's a whole different ride. If I haven't mentioned it, this is a uh, this is my Morgan Bones Arbutus pipe. Ben Apple. Really love that uh, saddle stem on it. Just really enjoy this pipe. Uh, so much that I bought a twin. And a sitting version, which I just had to have because why not? If you love something, why not have a few of them? You never know if it's going to stick around or not. You know, that Arbutus was kind of a fluke deal for him, getting a bunch of it at a really good price. So I figured I'd better get it while the getting was good. And they're pretty much gone now, except for, you know, his more expensive line of pipes, which are beautiful. But these were a downright bargain. In fact, he actually gifted me this one. And it inst almost instantly became one of my favorite pipes, especially for uh, heavy Englishes and Balkans. I just, I love the Arbutus. Um, I had looked at them earlier, and I just wasn't sure, you know. I didn't know. But, uh, yeah, no reason to fear the Arbutus. It's a good material, apparently. I love the blast on these. I know I mention it in other videos, so I don't want to dwell on it too long. But, uh, you know, we've recently lost John uh, John Harden matches 8-6-0, of course. And we've all had endless chats and talks about... I think a, a lot of us were just surprised at our grief. That, you know, those of us that really didn't know him personally, you know, like, other than YouTube... And maybe a little back and forth in a chat room or something, you know. And yet here we are grieving. Uh, it's odd, you know. Just a few days ago, um, before, you know, the, the whole Kobe Bryant thing with the helicopter crash, which was tragic, especially with there being so many, you know, children on the thing. Just a tragic loss of life. But I was looking at people that are so deeply, you know, moved by it. And, like, I'm not a big sports guy. So, for me, you know, it's tragic. But, you know, why are you all having this public group cathartic thing? Like, I don't understand that. And I just chalked it up to, I'm not a sports guy. That's why I don't get it. But, uh, and then a few days later... You know, we've got this to deal with, and uh, I think I understand it now. Con completely different situation, but probably the same social dynamic, maybe. I don't know. Not an expert. But the thing with John was he just... I think a lot of us saw ourselves in him because he was so giving of who he was and sharing his stories and uh, moments of his life with us over a pipe and of course our hobby that we all love and it's funny because I know he considered himself to be kind of an awkward you know not a natural conversationalist not a not a natural storyteller which is ironic because he was very good at that um, uh, you know he liked to have you know, his plan kind of sketched out ahead of time where he wouldn't feel like he was lost. I don't really do that because I'm me. Uh, I'm a left brain artist type and we just fly by the seat of our pants. And sometimes we crash and sometimes we soar. It is what it is. But uh, I think uh, 
I think he didn't really understand how natural he really was uh, at, at being a relatable person for people to uh, interface with, especially in a format like this. And uh, I think one thing we really loved about it was, you know, him sharing his stories. And uh, I've not really done much of that. My channel's pretty new, but uh, I was trying to think, is there any story I can share, especially with all of us kind of feeling some loss, maybe something that's a funny story or a weird story. And I'm going to try to do more of that kind of as an homage to him. Um, and because I think thinking about what I liked about him has made me reflect on what I do and don't do here. And, uh, you know, there's so many people that are more prolifically qualified to talk about tobaccos than I am. But I think with me, you're probably going to get your average newer type smoker, you know, that hasn't been smoking for five or 10 or 15 years. That's just delved into it really heavy and gotten to know what he likes and doesn't like pretty quick. Uh, I've tried a lot of tobaccos for, for a fairly new smoker, you know, six or seven months, really. And I feel like I'm a lot further along than I would be if it weren't for people like him that have put so much time into their channels where I can learn things, I can make educated guesses as to what to try next, or help find the words to describe what I, I am experiencing with tobaccos. And so that's a real gift that uh, him and a lot of other folks on YouTube have given us all as smokers. But I love the stories, and I think all of us did. Probably should have given this a little more tray time, but it's smoking really well anyway. So, in my early 20s, for a few years, I worked in auto parts. I started at one big chain and I went through their, started as a cashier and went through their training program, got back on the parts counter, went through their training program, got to know all that stuff pretty well, got to become more of a car guy in the process. Ended up taking over the tire department when that guy moved on to law enforcement. Found out I was a pretty good salesman. And I was good at just, you know, helping people make the right decision on things. Sometimes how you present things just, you know what they need and you know what they're about to do. And you're like, look, I can sell you this, but here's what this will do for you. And I think you'll be happier with this. And if you present it in the right way, they're more likely to say, he seems to know what he's doing. Let's go with him. And, uh, you know, I was a 20-year-old, 21-year-old kid. But uh, they could tell, you know, that I, I cared about what I was doing and, that made a big difference, but uh, there was a lot of work involved with that, and I was I just got tired of a lot of stuff at that store, you know. A lot of those jobs, you have them, you get tired of them. Pretty quick. We got this assistant manager sent in that was just out of the military, and... Uh, which can be a really good thing or a really bad thing, depending on the type of person it is. Because uh, I worked with a lot of ex-military guys that were just salt-of-the-earth awesome guys to work with because they had a very, a very real and pronounced understanding of how things ought to be and how they are and what it takes to just, let's get it done. And that was how I was raised. You know, I grew up in the suburbs of New Jersey. My family were one generation we were the first generation that didn't grow up on a farm in Illinois. So I grew up in a suburban back setting, but with parents that we culturally were not from there. I mean, you know, I grew up, we had a work ethic. You were expected to know how to work. You were expected to do things right. Um, in some cases, exactly right uh, or exactly as told. And if you didn't, you just were going to do them again. Uh, and that was important. It drove me friggin' nuts as a kid because, 
you know, being the type of guy I am, you know, I don't do real, really well with authority a lot of times. So, you know, we butted heads a few times, but, you know, I, you know, I was the kid, they were the parent. I was going to learn the lesson whether I liked it or not. We could use a little more of that in the world these days, but I digress. Probably the worst example of that. <laughs> Don't touch that stove. Psst, ah! Literally happened to me as a kid. Literally did that. A red hot stove. And I knew it was red hot and I knew it would burn me. Or at least I'm pretty sure I had to know that. But they told me not to. So, you know, a little insight into a young U.S. Piper. <laughs> Young little John boy. It's an important thing to realize about yourself. <laughs> I remember sitting in the basement, which was kind of a, a semi-converted toy play area for us. With my hand in a giant stainless steel mixing bowl full of ice. And you know how it is, your hand is throbbing because it's burned, because you did something really dumb. And it's in the ice, and that makes it feel a little better, but then it gets too cold, and that kind of hurts a little bit, and because it just sucks, and no matter what you do, it kind of sucks. And so I'm sitting there, and you know, I'm down there by myself, and I think they just sent me down there to pretty much cry myself out. It wasn't like a third degree burn or anything. I don't think it even blistered, but I kind of stuck for, you know, that little second, like, uh, uh. you know, it was long enough it stuck a second. So I was lucky it wasn't worse than it was, but I had soft little kid hands, so it hurt. And I remember crying and crying and crying and putting my hand in the ice and taking it out and looking at it. And I had that first little installment of wisdom. I don't know if it took, but for a second there, I'd kind of cried myself out. I looked at my hand and I thought, that was really dumb. Why did I do that? That was dumb. <laughs> so, and it was. So You could argue that that pattern had repeated itself multiple times later in my life after that. So I don't know how well I learned that lesson. But at least in regards to actual hot stoves and not touching them, it made its point. But, uh... So we got this assistant manager, and he was just kind of a snapper head. I loved the store manager. He was a good guy. But uh, I just kind of had enough. Our district manager was hanging out, and he was a tool. He was he was a fair man, but he was a bit of a tool. But this little kid, man, he was like that guy trying to make points all the time and just crapping all over anyone else to make his points. And a uh, little suck-up, that guy. Hard worker, but a suck-up. I hate a suck-up. So it got to the point where I had so much work and I was having so much extra BS I was having to do that I was going to have to go out in on my day off and probably work at least half a day off the clock just to get freaking caught up. And I mean, I wasn't making huge money at the time. You know, I'm wearing a shirt with my name on it, which if it were up to me, I would have had Habib put on it as a kind of a Ed Bundy, you know, nod. But, you know, I had to actually put my name on it. We may have had a name tag. But, you know, I would have had to be on it if it had been up to me. But, so, you know, it's hard to take a job too seriously where your name's on your shirt. <laughs> At that age, you don't take much seriously anyway. So I left. I just decided, you know what? I've had enough, and I left. In fact, I didn't go in that day. Um, the next day came where I was after that. I just took the phone off the hook and went back to bed because I realized I just had enough. And I went in the next afternoon and told him. And I walked in, the store manager looked at me, and he's like, yeah, I noticed you didn't come in yesterday. Uh, I was going to call you, but I had a feeling... I better not. And he was a good guy. I think his name was Jeff. I'm pretty sure it was. And uh, I was like, yeah, 
Jeff, uh, man, you know I really think a lot of you, and I've really, I've really tried to do a good job here for you. And you know, my sales were always up. You know, you compare all, all your sales are always compared to a given day from how that day sales were the year before, and they keep little books of it. And when he looked at it, you could tell I was just a getting it. The little shop manager would come in there with his vein bulging by 2 p.m. Don't send any more tires out there. I can't get them on today. And that's when I knew I was doing a good job when they were so busy. There was a point at which I was calling the tire store. Uh, I think it was like NTW or somebody up the street. I would sell four tires because we had really good prices on tires there. And uh, I would sell them these tires and tell them, look, I can't get any more tires put on. But I'll tell you what. Let me call up the street because most of the places will mount and put on any tires you already have, you know, for a certain fee because, you know, if they're not having a slow day, that helps them stay busy. And they make something off that, keeps their guys busy that they're paying anyway. So it got to the point where I would sell four tires, send them up front, and I would call that store up the street that was a competitor make them an appointment for installation on their car and say, I'll be right over in about 15 minutes because they're about 10 minutes up the street and they were in line to check out with their tires. And, uh, you know, it got to the point where that store got caller ID so that that would stop happening because they noticed they were installing so many of our tires that something was up. So that was pretty funny. But, uh, but I, it got old and I didn't want to be the guy in charge of that at the, that point. So I went to the competitor and they actually paid me a little bit more because I came from a company with a better training program probably uh, than what they had. And I had a pretty good amount of experience and they could tell, you know, I was a guy that was going to show up and, and do the job and, and, you know, that's what they wanted. And this was the Atlanta area. And at the time, Atlanta was growing. If you got tired of a job, you could quit it Thursday and have another job by Friday afternoon if you wanted it. I mean, there were just... Things were growing. It was expanding. There were new stores of every type going in constantly. So, you know, you didn't have to stay too invested in your, your suck job if it got on your nerves too bad. And I had just decided it went from my job to a suck job. So I decided to move on. And uh, so they gave me a little pay bump. And, of course, I was the guy that I always got whatever the maximum raise was, was which wasn't huge, but... You know, I would get a little bump up every six months, you know, both places. Uh, whatever they were allowed to give me, they'd always give me. Um, I was the guy that, you know, would always get to go do store inventories because they knew I would actually count the stuff. They would have to spot check because a lot of the guys that they would put on overtime at whatever store you were inventorying. Uh, so you'd get overtime a lot of times, which would be great. Um, when you're not making a lot, overtime's a beautiful thing. Because uh, suddenly you're making a decent income to count stuff. So, you know, I always made sure I did a really good job. And But, you know, you've got the guys that just show up. And uh, you have to go back and check everything they do. So they they figured out pretty quick, you know, they keep an eye on everybody. But, that yeah, he's he's a team player. He, he'll get it done. You know, you can trust this guy. Uh, you know, I wasn't always – I was the guy that might be five minutes late a lot. You know, because I'm just horrible about being places on time. And, of course, you had Atlanta traffic at that time, uh, which could be horrible at times. But, uh, you know, it, it went pretty well, got bumped up, and uh, really liked the new store. Worked there for over three years, which for me at that time was a pretty long time to work at one place. Because, like I said, if you got tired of someplace, see ya, I'm going across the street. But this company was, it did pretty well. And, uh, of course, we went through a few different store managers for a while there. I was in Tucker, Georgia, which at the time was still a sleepy little town. Now it's kind of grown up, and it's it's kind of, uh, kind of a bigger place. It looks more like a ghetto now, like it grew up into a nice suburb and then kind of got run down and cruddy. You know, Atlanta has just changed so much even in the last 20 years that I drove through it one of our last trips through there. There was something my wife wanted to visit, uh, a store, and it was in that area. And we were there for an hour, drive, and we're leaving, driving back through, and we stopped for gas. And I looked around, and I realized, crap, I know where we are. And nothing was familiar. Like, it was all not only different, but had been run down since it had changed and become different. So, I mean, it was, it was weird, but uh, it was just a much different area than it was when I was there. 
Um, but, uh, had a lot of fun working there. You know, it was, you know, there are still aspects of it that sucked, but that's part of having that, that level of job and that experience, you know, and sometimes you just have to embrace the suck is what I would often say. Um, and you know, get it done because what else are you going to do? You, you got to make a living, right? And, uh, and it wasn't bad. They were usually a good group of guys. There's always one or two snapper heads. But after a few different managers had kind of come and gone, they they sent in this young guy. And he was he was a pill. He was interesting and he was kind of fun. Like we would cut up and have fun with the guy. But I'm not sure his elevator went all the way to the top floor. He's you know, he had an unusual sense of humor. I won't get into all of it. But uh, he, he was a bit off, I think. But overall, a pretty decent guy, but wound a little too tight. And how can I put this? He was that guy that, you know, when you were in management, and what I figured out with this company was I did not want to be in management. I did not want to be an assistant manager. So I would get every pay bump, but anytime they were looking to put me in what I called a white shirt, because you went from the knit pullover with your name on it to a white shirt that you actually had to dry clean and have pressed. Uh, and, you know, if you were at least an assistant manager or anything along those lines or a manager, you had to wear that shirt. And I, it wasn't just that I didn't like the shirt. I didn't want the crap that went with it. I figured out for the amount, and those guys had to work uh, overtime pretty much all the time, whether they wanted to or not. A lot of times and sometimes, you know, not really on the clock, which isn't exactly legal. But, you know, when you're responsible for stuff and it's not done and you have a certain level of employees or a lack of them, sometimes you just got to stay and get stuff done. And, you know, when you're the guy in charge of it, that's you end up doing that stuff. And I understood that, but I didn't want to do that for what they were paying me. So I figured I want to be the guy that's just good enough that I get every single raise and that they don't want to lose me but screw up just enough <laughs> that they won't be too bent out of shape about me not wanting a position in management. Like every time you just about get ready to white shirt me, I'm going to do something that pisses you off either by accident or design. Uh, so, you know, that was kind of me at that stage of life. Uh, I thought I had it all figured out, which for that crappy job level, it, it worked for me at the time. And I was making decent money for where I was in life at that time. I was I was getting by, and uh, I was just old enough that I was able to you know hit some bars and have some fun off on my off time. And I didn't I didn't want to be too married to a, a suck job, you know. I just it was something that I had to do, and then there was the rest of the day or evening, uh, more like it. But but I always did a good job while I was there, and I did my best to take care of my customers. And, you know, so I was somebody they weren't going to run off, uh, even though I gave them cause to want to run me off a few times. But so we had this guy and he was like that guy that your district manager talks up of you're going places, kid, you know, like that his shirt is just immaculately pressed. And just in case it gets less than immaculately pressed, he'd have a spare hanging in his car. And if the district manager was coming by, he would go get the spare shirt and change into a fresh shirt just so he looked extra spiffy. I'm like, yeah, I don't know about this guy. Like, he's went a little tight for auto parts business in Tucker freaking Georgia, you know. But but he was all right. He For the most part, he was okay. But, you know, he also was, shall I say, not afraid to delegate uh, the grunt work at all. Uh, he put in hours, but, uh, you know, he definitely didn't do any of the worst part of anything that he could throw on somebody else. So he had that going for him. And he, he was just a little different, like I said. And, uh, so this one day we had truck coming in, which was our, you know, three times a week, the truck would come in with pallets loaded with all of our merchandise. And you'd have to, the truck drivers were not supposed to really unload the truck. They might get the pallet uh, jack and, and get the pallet onto our hydraulic lift and ride it down. And then you take over. They're not supposed to be moving stuff and bringing it into the store. That's, that's our job. Um, usually the manager and a helper would go back because that guy really doesn't need to be doing all that. He's a truck driver. He's not there to unload it. <clears throat> now those guys were really cool. Uh, never met a trucker I didn't like. 
And, uh, and they would usually help anyway, especially if you were really busy and you didn't have any help. They knew. They understood. They were working class dudes. And they were all raised like I was. You know, ah, just get it. Sometimes it sucks. Get it done. I'll give you a hand. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal. They're back on the road in 15 minutes anyway. You know, they were good guys. But uh, for the most part, we tried to, you know, you didn't want those guys getting hurt doing something they weren't supposed to be doing. So, so this guy would always take one of us with him. And it was usually me. It was usually me and my one buddy, which was an ex-military guy, um, which... He was a Hispanic dude. He's strong as anything, but he was a real, little short guy, you know, a little Oompa Loompa guy. He was really strong, but really short. But, uh, and he was a good cat. But, uh, so we had this, uh, he wasn't there that day. So the manager grabs me, and it's just me and the manager with his impeccably pressed white shirt, his little name tag, bling, you know, and he's got his coffee cup, and he's got his clipboard. And you can tell with these two things in each hand, uh, that he's not planning on doing much of anything else besides holding that coffee cup, holding that clipboard, and telling people what to do. People meaning me at this particular point. And the driver, of course, was helping us, you know, get it. He was riding it down the lift, and I was taking it from there. And so I had pretty much unloaded this entire truck by myself uh, from once it hit the ground on. And, uh, of course, we unwrapped most of the pallets and some of the other guys were getting them out of the back room so that there was room for us to get the rest of them in the building and all that so we could lock the back door back up. So there's a lot of that going back on. And we had a dumpster in the back corner in that area where the trucks came in and where our loading dock uh, bay door was and all that. So, you know, we've got a lot of shrink wrap and junk like that and cardboard and stuff building up from the process. So this guy had not put his friggin' clipboard or his coffee down at all in the entire time that my boat was unloading this truck. And the driver even said something to me at one point. He's like, well, I bet he doesn't get too tired by the end of the day, huh? And I thought, yeah, that SOB, he doesn't, does he? Might get tired of telling me to do stuff. And I had just about had enough of this crap, but, you know, it was what it was. So we get it done. Driver's on his way. All is well. All that's left is picking up the shrink wrap and the cardboard and crap and getting it in the dumpster. Well, people would leave oil that needed to be recycled and stuff if we weren't open. They would leave it by the dumpster a lot of times. And, you know, we had a recycle bin inside the building that we would put it in and it would come and get recycled. So if you left that crap out there, I was the guy that got to go lug the nasty antifreeze jug full of, you know, used motor oil and pour it in our big giant vat that they would empty, you know, once a month or whatever. So I had taken care of some crap like that. Well, somebody had obviously thrown a bunch of antifreeze in the dumpster and it must have not had a top on it or something. And... You know, Anna's Freeze has that kind of sickly sweet smell to it. You may have noticed if you ever had a leaky radiator that bees or wasps sometimes will kind of swarm your car over it sometimes. Especially on a real hot day, they just mistake it for something with a lot of sugar. So... I'm picking all that stuff up and I'm throwing it in the dumpster and I'm not wanting to touch the dumpster. So I've got this little, little stick of wood that was laying out there in the parking lot. And I'm using that to lift up the top and throw stuff over the top because it is covered with ants. Ants have absconded, have just zeroed in on this antifreeze slick on the side of this garbage container. And it was like a living wall of ants. Just something out of a movie. Just, all, I mean, it was dump, dumpster shaped, but it was just a wall of ants. So I was being careful. I'd already shut the side door, but there was like one last piece of shrink wrap or something. And I had just made like 14 trips of stuff to the dumpster. So Mr. Clipboard and Coffee puts the clipboard down, still has his coffee. and walks over, leans over and gets this last little balled up piece of shrink wrap that I had missed and says, hey, hold on a second, hold that up. I'll get this. 
his big contribution to the entire you know afternoon of offloading all this stuff and cleaning up afterwards was he picks up one piece of shrink wrap so he walks over to the living wall of ants dumpster with me still holding the stick facing it and just tosses it over the top whoosh and he's right next to it well i don't think that i intentionally did this but if i had had time to think about it i would not have changed a thing but at any rate, I had the lid pretty far up, and it's a big, heavy plastic lid that covers, like, the whole top of this thing. And I've got a stick that's, you know, three and a half, four feet long. So I've got the thing propped up. And uh, in one fluid motion, I pull the stick away, turn, and take a giant step away from the dumpster. Because I think as I'm doing it, I bet this knocks a bunch of those ants loose. I don't want to be there when that happens. So real-time thought turn, step away, no problem. He did not see this coming. So he is instantly, as I turn back around, he is dry, you know, he didn't drop his coffee cup somehow, but he is going crazy. You know, he's covered with a wall of ants and his little immaculately pressed shirt. He's freaking out. And it's hilarious. I couldn't freaking breathe. I thought I was going to die. I have literally covered this guy head to toe with ants. And if ever somebody had it coming... It was that time, so it was great, and uh, I was just dying, so <laughs> I couldn't even look at him. He's every once in a while, oh, there's another one. Oh, did I get them all? I'm like, yeah, yeah, man, <laughs> you're good, and I am dying laughing. I can't breathe, so I go to the front of the store, and everybody else kind of knows how's it, how it is with this guy, and I'm trying to tell them the story of what's happened, and in the meantime, He's running to the restroom to, you know, get, get him, you know, his shirt is untucked and he looks, you know, his hair is a mess. And they're like, what's up with that guy? Well, that, you know, it brings me back to where I can't breathe instantly. I'm trying to tell the story. They're laughing at me because I'm laughing so much I can't breathe or tell the story. Well, I'm finally, I'm like, ants, covered with ants. It was great, you know. So the, the guy, about five or ten minutes passed, I finally got the story out. They're all dying laughing about it. Here comes the guy, now he's got a shirt tucked back in, and he's, he's slicked his hair back and got everything just right, and he's picked his clipboard back up and got his big giant cup of coffee. He's like, oh, 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 he plays it off. You know, what can you do at that point? You've just been covered with a wall of ants, and everybody's laughed about it because shit is funny as hell. And <laughs> pardon my French, but it is. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, he comes up at the counter. Oh, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. It was just a few ants. And I noticed he's still drinking his cup of coffee that he was holding the whole time. I was surprised. I was like, I can't believe you didn't drop that cup of coffee. And then I look at him, and he's taking three or four swigs of his coffee. Oh, it was okay. It wasn't that bad. I got them all off me. It was just, it wasn't that bad. He's, 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 he's just telling it. He, he's overtelling it. And uh, you could tell he's embarrassed because he's turning three shades of red. Well, I look at him. I'm like, hey, that's the same cup of coffee you had out there, right? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, man, you better go check that. You're probably drinking ant coffee. And he turns white as a sheet of paper and, like, runs for the bathroom. We all lost it again. So he comes back another five or ten minutes later, and he's like, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. There was there was one or two in there. I'm like, yeah, you drank the rest of them. But uh, so that that's my uh, that's my funny story. I probably took far too long in telling it, but... Uh, Sometimes life and work sucks, but every once in a while, every once in a while, my friends, you get a chance to cover your manager with a wall of ants. And when life presents you with that opportunity, pull the trigger. <laughs> the U.S. Piper out.